morning, everyone. Welcome to your O'Connell Gospel Chapel. Hey, by the way, if you have any uh, uh, shoe boxes, you need to put them out there right now, ASAP, because they're taking them and delivering to the distribution center. Okay? Anybody got boxes? Gone once? Gone twice? No God. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> I'm glad you're all here today. Uh, ready to worship. And praise our one and only living God. All right, Romans 15, 9 through 11 says, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. Again, it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. Father, we just thank you that we have the ability and the opportunity to praise you and worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen. So please stand. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. As we welcome this week of giving thanks, I would like to look at the Psalms. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving in our hearts. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all kings. Psalm 95, 1 to 3. Please join in singing. He has made me glad and feel free to clap along.
take your seat. and receive our tithes and offerings. John 8, 31 and 32. It says, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Father, we thank you that your word is truth. We also ask you, Lord, to bless this offering. Use it for your honor and glory and multiply it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let the 
The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. My heart jumps for joy, and with my song I give thanks to him. Psalm 28, 7. Please stand or jump for your Lord and sing, To God Be the Glory. today. Children ages four through second grade are dismissed for children's church. Everyone else, share your greatest blessing with your neighbor. I was at a basketball game. Was it basketball? Yep, yep. The girls, it was good. She didn't want to sit in the stands. So, yeah. well, you know, you don't get to watch it. So, you, you were the past governor, right? Yeah, hanging out at dinner. We're not. So, maybe we'll go back. I thought that too. I was like, mm, maybe he's just a bad gene flow. I didn't exactly think that. <laughs> Okay, so if you got your bulletins, you can go along with me here. <clears throat> Let's start off with Monday, uh, 6.30 p.m. is Mama Vera with Apologetic in the Youth Center. And Wednesday, 6 p.m., Thanksgiving Eve service. That's at 6 p.m. And then Saturday, 7 a.m. is Men's Prayer in the Family Room and upcoming events 
of course, this is a practice for the uh, children's Christmas play in the sanctuary here at November 28th, December 5th, and the 12th. So be aware of those dates. And then December 2nd, we have Christmas church decorating. And I know the new daily breads are here for the, for the winter or fall season, so if you haven't already picked one up and you would like, they're in the back. Uh, I'm going down the list here. Oh, yes. At Lake London Bible Camp, that's on December 4th at 6 p.m. on Saturday. Um, usually they ask if you'd call ahead and make reservations. I don't know if it's filled up yet or not. If you plan on going, uh, they ask you to, to call and make reservations. So, And then also on uh, Thursday, if you're looking for someone to uh, help with child care. So if you're interested in doing that. All right, that's all I have. Tom DeWint. Good morning. Uh, next week, uh, we have our missionaries are coming. Uh, it's Chris and Sarah Baker. They're creative access workers, so we really don't say where they're from or what they're doing. But uh, they're coming to share the ministry that they've uh, done since they've been here last, because they were here, I believe, a couple of years ago. Uh, and they're on furlough for till middle of January. So they're only home for like two and a half months. Uh, and we will have a collection, a, a free will offering at the end of service. And we usually do that for home expenses, whether it's for gas money to go back and forth or hotels or whatever. Uh, so we're going to just take a free will offering. And if you're going to write a check, you make it directly to Chris or uh, Sarah Baker. So uh, that's going to be next weekend. Uh, we're excited to hear uh, what the Lord's doing in their uh, ministry. Uh, and then during, in between first service and second service during Sunday school hour, uh, there's an opportunity that they're going to share with us all of the other stuff that they don't share during service. Or if you have any questions, uh, they're going to have a time that they can discuss their ministry more deeply. So I invite you to come, not only for service, but to, to see how God's working through their lives and through them. So, and that'll be next Sunday. So, thank you.
Crystal. Sorry, whoever's listening out in TV land. Uh, <laughs> so we're talking about ugly sweaters. And then what we must understand about that is that God has asked us to guard our words because our words are very powerful. You know that. So I have a little game to play. And maybe when I say a word, I want you to give an association to that word, what it makes you think of, what makes you, what it makes you feel. So the first one is snow. You say, sure. what? Yeah. Ah. So I'll say yay, okay? How about this one? Hot chocolate. Ooh, yes. Marshmallows in the hot chocolate. <laughs> Christmas lights. How many love to decorate their tree with lots of lights? Yeah, I know, lights really mean a lot. I know my wife loves them. And then also, here's another one, eggnog. Yum? How many say yum? How many say yuck? How many just say, I don't have any word on this at all. I'm just listening. (laughs) And the last one is mistletoe. How many say kiss? Uh, yes. How many actually have a mistletoe in their house during this season? What? How many kiss during this season? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you know, when you think about it, does, you know, I know there are people who like eggnog, but I've had it, and it's just nasty for me. But, again... We have a split house. Some love it, some don't. And so words that we have carry meaning. And it's how we say those words and when we say those words. And when we look at these passages, and and we're going to be looking into Proverbs, we're going to see something that the Proverbs address. Have you read through Proverbs? You find they address the mouth and the words. And those are powerful things for us to understand. That the words that come out of our mouth have power attached to it. Listen to what uh, <clears throat> Solomon says in Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue has power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. You know, when you think of that, God says, I'm giving you the responsibility to speak to those that are around you, to speak truth, to be put together as you speak this, because this truth is so often missed by Christians. We forget that our words actually have power to them, and we can actually uh, really ruin a person's life by the words that are said. And so when you think about when does this show up, these ugly words, the, the power of these words, you know they show up is when we gather together for Christmas. You know, Christmas season seems to be just like that. Now, I don't know about you, but I know in the first day when everybody comes to the house, right, you haven't seen them maybe for six months, maybe two months, everybody's hugging and kissing and, oh, I love you, can't wait. And then you give them a couple days and back in the back of your mind saying, boy, I just wish they'd leave. I don't know if you have anybody like that. I don't think you do. But the fact is, those thoughts come up that we love people, we are just happy, and yet ugly words show up around the table. And so they can do real damage. So you have a decision to make, and you probably know what the decision is. First, the decision is, do I keep it to myself? You know, you may have something that maybe you think is relevant, but it may hurt. So what do you do with that? Do you just hold back and say nothing? Or do you vomit it over that person. You know, how many have done that? Well, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. I think it's always a temptation to to speak something to somebody to make them understand that you're really serious about it, but you end up ruining that relationship. And when we look at 20 and 21 during this season, well, it has been the most hardest season for a lot of people. But I've noticed a lot of dislike and bad words and things said that I thought 
wow, just give it a pandemic and we have people talking to each other like they hate each other. How many have seen that? I know I have. We need to be more careful in what we say with our words. Because remember, our words has power. It gives life or death to those words. And we need to make a deliberate effort today and every day to speak words that are uplifting and to deliberately avoid these ugly words. So we are to say things that encourage people. But I want you to understand what it means to encourage. In courage means that this balloon, think of it as someone's life. You know what you do when you encourage, you're giving them courage to go on. But you see, when you discourage somebody, you take all the courage out of them. Just by the words that you speak, life and death are in our hands and actually with our tongue. We need to be careful because Paul says in Ephesians 4.15, we are to speak truth in love to one another. You see, that's the thing we have to do is we got to make that decision. We must understand that there are ways that we can speak these things with truth and love. And so, so do we avoid those, uh, uh, those situations, avoid sharing truth with somebody? No, I don't think we do, even though we encourage people. But there are times and there are places where truth needs to be spoken. But there are also times and places where we need to address a difficult conversation. But that shouldn't be done around the kitchen table with all the family, right? I don't know about you, but I think of family vacation. I, th I think of how crazy that whole thing was and all the difficulties in the family and all the things that are coming out. Well, we don't want to do that, but what we want to do is share the truth and be able to address difficult situations, but there are ways to do this. There are positive ways and there are negative ways. So we have to understand power of life and death is in this tongue. And we all have one, don't we? And so we see this. And now when we look at our text here today, James is addressing this very powerful issue about the tongue, about how we speak to each other. And you see, James was Je is Jesus' brother. Remember that. And he's the head of the church. And what we see with James is that he's addressing this issue about how we speak to one another. And, you know, he's saying to them, you know, you have taken this time to learn how to speak truth to each other. Don't allow an ugly word to root it all. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to, to James chapter 3. And we're going to address it in three parts as we speak, as I speak this morning. And we're going to see that in James 3, 3 through 6, that's the first one. James 7 and 8. James 3, 7 and 8. And then the last one is James 3, 9 through 12. But here's the first portion of what James teaches about the tongue. He says this. When we put bits into mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or ships. As example, although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Verse 6. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. Wow, what a reality check about our tongue. You ever thought of that, about that? Now, what is James telling us? Stop talking certain ways. Stop. And he tries to share with us. He, he gives us words that how we are to control the tongue. James gives several examples. Do you see them? Do you see what he does? He looks at all things around him. He says, well, horses are, are governed 
by a bit in the mouth. So we know that. We see that. Ships, we've seen that too. I was on an aircraft carrier, and we were in dry dock, and I just looked at the propeller. It was huge. They had several of them, but they had smaller rudder in comparison to the size of the ship. And you think, we were able to go across the ocean to, to Japan, and we were able to go around in circles, all because of the way the captain wanted to go. So we know that a rudder is something that, that we need for a ship. A, uh, the forest, how are they started? By a small spark. We see that in California a lot. We see all these wildfires. The same is true about your tongue and my tongue. The, this tongue of ours, if it's not controlled, even though it's a small part to the whole body, if we're not careful, it will control you and me. So think about the last time you got an email. It was not a nice email. When you read it, you became angry. Maybe you really just became sad. You didn't like what that person said. How about the last time someone texted you? You know the problem? I like these things. You know, I like the phone. But the uh, problem with is the messaging is that you really can get into a toxic conversation with somebody. And you just keep on doing that. You know, you're texting. They said something. Oh, then someone else said something to you. And it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's toxic. So the last time someone text, texted you, were you frustrated? What was the emotion that was attached to it? What were you thinking? What were you feeling when someone wrote those things to you or typed them out? And maybe you don't have this. Maybe you've got a letter, and that's even worse. So we see that that first time we hear this, we respond in negative ways. We just do. When it's an email, we shoot one off just as powerful as the other one. If it's a text, we keep on texting. So what we have to do and what I have to do is you've got to slow down. You've got to slow down and say, what am I saying? Why am I saying this? I'm, and before you go click, 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 click with your fingers or your thumbs or whatever you do with them, you know, old people do this. But the fact is you got this thing in your hand and someone says something to you that just riles you up. As a Christian, how do you respond? Do you just say, hey, I understand what you're saying. Maybe we need to go out for coffee and talk about it. I find this is the worst place to try to solve any problems. Oftentimes, if there's a big problem, you don't use this. You don't use an email. You, you actually meet with somebody, talk with them. And so we are to control our words. And without a restraint on this tongue, our words can lead us to deeper problems and conflict. So we, what we need to do is put a leash on our lips. Notice, now go back to our text and look at verse 7 and 8. Notice what he says. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea, sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. You know that, right? Um, when was the last time you went to, well, has anybody gone to SeaWorld? It's a lot of fun, isn't it? I, I went to it when I was in, in San Diego, and how they took Shamu, at least at that time, I think he's gone now, but uh, Shamu, and he, they had him do all kinds of crazy tricks. Well, because they tamed him. But notice what, P, uh, notice what James says in verse 8. But no man being can tame the tongue. No human being can tame this tongue. Wow. When we think about it, our words, and it says, it says that our words are evil, restless evil, and deadly poison. And, you know, we don't think of that, do we, at the time that we're saying something that can be that way. But James says, left unguarded, our tongues are like this. How we speak to each other. And so we see, how do we solve this? How do we have control? How can we put that 
that device that says, okay, now I'm not going to say this. What do I do? Well, first off, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, being a believer, remember when you came to Jesus, the Spirit of God came to live inside of you. And you know when you're doing something you shouldn't do, he nudges you, he tells you, you may feel, you may feel guilty. You may say, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. So how do I tame my tongue so that I be able to be able to encourage and uplift and not deflate somebody? You know, deflating people is a lot easier <clears throat> than encouraging them. You know that? It's so much easier. It doesn't take much. And so what we see here are three things I want us to be able to look at that you can use to help guide you in the way you speak. So the first one is this. Will what I'm about to say honor God? When I mean honor is that in great respect for God. What I say about him reflects about what I think about him. So when I say things, will that word that I speak honor him? It says in Psalm 8, 1846, The Lord lives, thanks be to my rock, my God, my Savior, be honored. We are to reflect God's character. And so the first thing that I must remind myself is that when I say something, will it honor God? Now, when you think about it, many of us may not say what's, what we're really thinking, and probably that's good. But the other thing is I think it's easier to think things and dismiss it rather than confess it as wrong. But we see here, do the words I speak give God glory? Does it reflect his greatness? So that's the first thing. Think about that. It takes some time to do this. The second thing is this. Will, I, will what I'm about to say honor the person that I'm saying it to? Am I honoring the person? You see, when you think of it, when we respect and honor people, we say certain things about them that encourage them. So think about it, men, husbands, your wife, your kids, your grandkids. Encourage them. And the one thing you can say to yourself is this. Are the words I'm going to say, if, I, if they were said to me, would they encourage me or would they discourage me? See, we don't think about it in the heat of the moment. We'll just shoot something off or say something to somebody and then torpedo them and leave. I've, been, I met those, I've met people like that. That's hard. And the most, the response of, you know, I'm just as human as you are, the response is I want to respond back because I'm hurt. But we must remember the second thing. Will what I'm about to say honor that person that I'm going to say it to? So first off, will it honor God when I speak those words? Secondly, will I honor people, the person that I'm saying it to? But here's the last one. Will what I'm about to say give me regret? Will I have regret once I open my mouth and say that word or that sentence or that paragraph or whatever it is, and when I go to bed, lay my head on a pillow, do I regret those things? Do I say, I should have never said that? And it may be men to your wives that are laying right next to you. And they say, is everything okay? Yeah, it's okay. Well, they just don't want to start another fight, another argument. Just remember, does it glorify God? Because that's a picture of what I think of him. Does it honor people? The people that I'm talking to, are they, are they encouraged? Last, we said, do you regret what you said? And all these things are fixed. You can fix these things with the Spirit of God to help you. Remember, have the Holy Spirit help you do these things. You cannot do it on your own. 
You, if you try to say, oh, I'm going to try to do it, I'm gonna, you're going to fail. It happens. How many have tried to do something like that and it failed? Yeah, it has. My goodness. But God knows that. And see, the power of the word brings life or death. And notice what he says, what we just talked about, that they, they enjoy the fruit thereof. So here we are. The need of the Spirit of God. And the reason why our ugly words are so crucial during this time that we shouldn't do it is because what are we celebrating? Jesus. We're celebrating what he did for us on the cross, what he would do future-wise. But being born in a manger, we're, we're worshiping him. That's why it's so important that we put a guard on our mouth. Not just on Christmas, but throughout the whole year. And that's going to take training. Because the fact is, we are to be representatives of his joy and not sabotage it. So let's go back to our text and look at verses 9 through 12. Chapter 3, 9 through 12. It says here, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings. James, can you be more blunt? I mean, that is really blunt. He just says, this is the way it is. Sometimes we need to hear truth that way. It has to be clear, straightforward, and it may, may hit us in the chest. Say, oh my goodness, James, what are you saying? With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. You see, people, all of us have been created in God's likeness. So whether it's a person that you work with, he doesn't know the Lord, but, you know, it's easy to be able to say, oh, look at what he's doing, oh, look at what he said, oh, or you're going to shoot off another email because you didn't like it. Remember, he says that we try to praise God and also curse people. Kind of crazy, isn't it? Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. He's speaking to you, he's speaking to me. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Is that a yes or a no? I can't hear you. Yeah, that's, those are some easy things that James says. Here, look at that. Out of nature, does that happen? We well, say no. Then it says, my brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear fruit? Yes or no? Can't even hear you. Turn these things up. Well, we know that, right? We're saying, James, we understand your point. But he's just trying to say this to us, that he's telling his church, we need to fix this. We need to do something about it. Every year, every year, everybody around the world that has some Protestant or Christian beliefs, we celebrate, we celebrate his birthday. On Christmas, all oh, around the world, you know, some are some celebrations are just grandiose. It's just wonderful. You see, some churches, huge churches, they have a they have a whole skit. They bring in the camels. They bring in all these animals, all to celebrate the Lord. And then you come. There are some churches that do it very simple, but the fact is that we do celebrate the Lord on this day, and we do that because we love Him. And so we see that they, we sing hymns. Oh, we, we'll sing more of them as the, as the month goes on. And we light candles. Or maybe we plug in Christmas trees and we love lights. And lights, you know, I've learned to love lights. My wife loves the, oh, she just loves a lot of lights. And it's hard to take them off at the end. You know, you're trying to make sure it's all, like we said last week. Uh, but just think about that. And here's a question. Why do these people go to this extent to worship the Savior and turn around and say ugly words to each other? You ever think of that? Why is it? Well, James says we got to address this. And here it is, as blunt as can be, you can't have it both ways. 
you either praise God and you can't be cursing people at the same time. That's a challenge, isn't it? Now, cursing isn't using those bad words. Well, for some people it could be. But the fact is, you're, de you're deflating them. You're gonna, you ever get to that place where you just, they just upset and you're deflating. And you can see it in their eyes and they respond back with hurt and hate. I don't know, have you ever been in that situation? I think it can be. Some of it may be milder than that, but the fact is we still leave an imprint because instead of inflating, <laughs> encouraging, we discourage people. And you know, when you think of that, like he says, a spring cannot have both salt and fresh water, and a fig tree cannot produce olives. So we cannot be hypocritical in the way we speak. I'll tell you something, that it's pointing to me as well as to you, that God says, hey, Pete, you worship me, you praise God, you encourage other people, you try to live with no regrets. You want to give him honor. But the thing is, we have a sin nature. Yes, we died. The, when Christ died, I died. But there's also that other part is that we still have that part of that sin nature. We're not perfect, and these things happen. We need to understand that, and I think you do. And so we need to start speaking from the heart, a heart that has been transformed, because the heart is a wi window to who we are. It reveals that we need transformation. You know, when you think about it, we need to be transformed. We need to be changed. Luke 6, 45 says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of, his, out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. That's Jesus. If your heart is full of God and gratitude to God and people... That's what your heart is filled with. Jesus says a good man has good things coming out of his heart. But if we allow our tongue to be untamed, there are things we say to people that we regret. So where do we begin? Well, first starts with us. Do you need healing? Now, that's the thing. What you need to do is just today or sometime today, if you need that healing, you need to go to him and you need to confess that to him. But the hard part is to go to that person that you hurt. And you know, when you think of it, we sometimes speak out of a broken heart. And that broken heart lashes out at others if we're not careful. Sometimes we speak out of a hurtful heart. And sometimes that can turn into cruel words to others. So we have to have an honest look inside of our hearts and our life to speak life to others, to encourage others for what needs to be done. So, for me, I, I want to be able to have this love for God and love for others. I'm sure all of us here want that. We do love God. We do love people. It just happens to be that Sometimes we open our mouth and insert our foot and say things we shouldn't have said. And we know that happens to us. But if we have the word of God, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He does that. That's what we need to do. We need to be cleansed. We need to be healed inside. And, and that's what is important, that we speak for love for God and for others. But also, guess what? We want to have that overflow of Jesus in our life. So it's like a reservoir that we know Jesus. We're getting to know him through his word. We're praying. Get to know. We want to be able to get from that reservoir and speak those words of life and encouragement to other people. So where does this change first begin? If a change is going to happen, it's going to happen with the people closest to you. 
yeah, it's not easy, but you know, it's, uh, it begins with, with people that are around us. And you see, when we lean towards Jesus, our words reflect a heart of gratitude for that individual, for that man, for that woman, for those kids. We lean towards Jesus. And you know, when you think of it, it will be effective in our spouse. When our spouse hears those words and we encourage them, they, they take that in. You don't know how important it is, men, to speak words of love to your wife. It, it's so important that the, we say it. We say that we love our wife. We say it. Guys, some guys don't say it. They expect us to, some guys, they, they say, well, don't you see it? See what? How about saying the words, men? Tell your wife. How about your kids? Oh, I tell you, our kids need to hear how much we love them. You know, it's, you know, when I think of being a grandpa, well, papa. And Nana, no, trying to get used to that. But anyway, I like Grandpa. But the fact is, you know, when I see my little boy Rowan, what I want to keep on doing is speaking words of encouragement. See, when we lean towards Jesus, if we're in the Word of God, we're, we're reading it, we're studying it, we're, it's, we're absorbing it, we're absorbing Jesus' life, we know how Jesus would act. So I think of little Rowan, yeah, I just want to speak good things into his life. Think about dads who have small children. I mean, they can drive you insane some days, right? If we're honest, not that we, but they do. And, and, and we're just, oh man, I tell you, I know my boys, they did that to me. They kind of pushed buttons and I reacted when they pushed the fact is, what I'm trying to say is that the time is short. Someone told me that a long time ago in one church, one older lady, she's home with the Lord now, but this older lady said, Pete, Pastor Pete, the time is short. Speak to them in love. Wow, you know what? That was really strong words, but it encouraged me to say the right words. How about you? With people that are around you, they're waiting to hear it. There's a book by Mark Batterson, Praying Circles Around Your Children. I don't know if you ever heard that book, but in his book, he talks about praying circles around your children. In other words, what do you want your kids to be? And what does God want your kids to be? Mark says in his book, and this is what he says. He says, then speak over them words. A friend of mine, he says, does this with his daughter. He has said it to her often, so much so that she can repeat back those words to him. And she believes this. You know what the words are? I believe every kid wants to hear this. You're beautiful. She, she said, you're beautiful. Do you know how our young girls need to be told by their daddy that they're beautiful? What I find is that if we don't do that, they're going to look to somebody else to say they're beautiful. Say it over your child that they're beautiful. That's what he did. You're kind. You're strong. You're worth it. Words matter how you use them, and when you use them. I, I just, I remember, I, all I can do is go back to the days when Adam was, he was like a preteen or teen, and he had interest in teaching. So I remember one day I got a, got a coffee cup where it says, greatest teacher in the world. I says, Adam, here, here the coffee cup. I believe you'll be a really great teacher someday. Well, you know, I said it long enough. He got a degree. 
and teaching. And he taught children of uh, the not privileged children, Native Americans, Latinos. He spoke to them. You see, that's what you can do with your kids. You find something in their life that God has put there, and you say it. Guys, say it to your kids. Grandpas, say it to your grandchildren. Men and women, we have that responsibility. So what I invite you this, this, this season, to encourage people with words that inflate, that blows up with encouragement and lift them up. And so when we speak about the Lord Jesus Christ and his birth, boy, I tell you, we want to touch hearts. We want to touch people's lives. So here's your decision for the week, something you could do. Is ask the Lord for that one person, that one individual that can benefit from your kind words. Just one. You know, when you think of that one person, I remember many times, you know, we, Mary Lee and I, you know, we would give counseling and then we have counseling ourselves. And they said that, uh, and this one book says, uh, find 10 things, each of you, husband, wife, 10 things that you could put down that only you can do. You can hire out someone to mop your floors, clean your windows, all the. What are the 10 things that you would put down? We're saying one person, and maybe it's your spouse today. Maybe it's your husband. Maybe it's your wife. Maybe it's your kids. Those 10 things, you just write something down, and then what you do in 30 days, you don't tell them when you're going to do it. You just do it. And you know how encouraging that is? You're always waiting for that, oh, when is she going to, what, what has she written down? What is she, what's she going to do next? And then she does it, or he does it. And you think, oh, thank you. And you're all encouraged because you know you have nine more coming. So try it. But ask God for that one person that you can benefit from your words. As I said, you can write up the list. But maybe make a phone call. You know, out of the blue, you, God gives you this person, and God gives you words, say those words. Because we don't know what mindset they're in right now. You know, we can also send a text. Texts are good. Just make sure that you look them over and see if they're going to glorify God, if they're going to really uplift this individual. And then you won't regret this because it stays on your phone in the cloud. I like to find that cloud. <laughs> Just empty it out. But it's called delete, but anyway, uh, you get it. But see, take a text. Maybe a handwritten letter. Do you know that handwritten letters, how many have gotten a handwritten letter within the last month? A couple of you. But you know, that's kind of like an old-fashioned way of communicating. But you know, when you handwrite your letter to that individual, you know what it says to that person? First, you spent a lot of time to write it out. And as they read it, they see maybe you're more artistic, and you underline, you put little flowers here and there. But that person is reading that and says, oh my goodness, I needed to hear that. How many of you ever received a letter that just like say, wow, that's exactly what I needed. Who, who, you, you did, didn't you? I think we all have. And we think, oh my goodness, I haven't heard from that person for a couple of years, and here's what they said. How about just inviting them all for coffee? We have this great little coffee shop in town. I'll just plug for them. I like it. Tuesday through Saturday, they're open. You know, you can take someone over there and have a cup of coffee. Or go to any restaurant. Sometimes that is good, too, because you sit down and you say, I have no agenda. All I want to do is tell you that I love you. Could you imagine? Because if you ask that one person to go out with you, say, hey, can we have coffee next week? Okay, why do you want coffee next week? What's going on? You know, pastors act that way. What do you want to do? You want to, what? No, I'm not available. But see, that's the thing is that maybe you want to take them out. All of this is to say, 
Remember, your words have life and death in them. And you need the Holy Spirit to help you to guide your words. But if you're discouraged this season, I mean, you're just down. Nothing left. You need to ask the Lord to fill you with his spirit. Turn with me to Galatians 5. 22. <clears throat> you probably read this before, but here, for those who are frustrated, scared, confused, discouraged, and you're a believer, those things can happen to us. We, we can't get depressed. We can't get discouraged. We can be deflated. It happens. But you don't need to stay there. You don't have to remain in that state of mind or heart. Because this is what Paul tells us to do. He told the Galatian believers. But the fruit of the Spirit, fruit, singular, of the Spirit, is love. You know, that's the first thing he does, that he loves us. You know, when you think about it, Jesus is, is one that loves us more than anybody else in this world. Our wives can't give it to us. Our, our husbands can't give it to us. Our kids can't. He gives us all this love. It's greater. There's love that we get from them, but nothing like the love of Christ, of how much he loves us. Joy, peace, peace with God, peace of God, and spreading that peace out throughout the world. God gives us his peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. If you're discouraged this season, or maybe you've been deflated, maybe someone has deflated you, and you're just going to live that way throughout the whole season, you're going to hate Christmas, you're going to hate New Year's, you're just going to say, let's get on with it, and then the snow comes, you're going to hate the snow, and you're going to say, oh man, I need to move to Florida, and then you're going to hate Florida. You're never going to be happy until you get things straightened with God. So that's what we need to do. Be filled with love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, grace, mercy, and hope. So it's been a tough year. 2020, 2021 is a bad movie. I tell you, I, we have a sequel going on in 21. I hope we don't have a sequel in 2022. But you know what? God's in control. And we can only say it because we know him. He is sovereign in our lives. Did you know that he doesn't allow anything to happen to you unless he allows it to happen? Things happen to us not by accident, but by design. Oh, I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters, as we leave this place today, don't be an ugly sweater. Be a person who uses their words to encourage, to uplift, and to love others. And for those of you that are discouraged, take Paul's advice, not advice, but a command to be filled with the Spirit. Do that today. Amen? Father God, I just pray right now that, Lord, yeah, we, what we say with our lips and our mouth is so extremely important. But even what's going on in our thoughts and now our words, may they be acceptable in your sight. May we be sensitive to the Spirit of God. May we be able to say, God, you are there. Help me today. I'm in a bad place. Help me today to say the right things that encourage people. Help me to do this, Lord Jesus. And I know you'll help me as I surrender myself to you. In Jesus' name, amen.